Uh, all right. Thank you, thank you, thank you, um, worship team. That's like a perfect lead-in to uh, the verses uh, that we're going to be checking out today in the book of Psalms, because uh, in these verses you'll see it is a person giving great praise to God for his faithfulness, but is now needing more of it yet again. So, I know you just sat down, but in honor of God's Word, can you please stand again as I read Psalm 40, Psalm 40, and it goes like this. I hoped intensely for the Lord to help me, and he turned to me and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire, and he set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what we ha he has done and be amazed, and they will put their trust in the Lord. All oh, the joys of those who trust the Lord, who have no confidence in the proud or in those who worship idols. Oh, Lord, my God, you have performed many wonders for us. Your plans for us are too numerous to list. You have no equal. If I tried to recite all your wonderful deeds, I would never come to the end of them. You take no delight in sacrifices and offering. Now, now that you have made me listen and I finally understand, you don't require burnt offerings or sin offerings. Then I said, look, I have come as it is written about me in the scriptures. I take joy in doing your will, my God, for your instructions are written on my heart. I have told all your people about your justice. I have not been afraid to speak out, as you, O oh Lord, well know. I have not kept the good news of your justice hidden in my heart. I have talked about your faithfulness and saving power. I have told everyone in the great assembly of your unfailing love and faithfulness. Lord, don't hold back your tender mercies from me. Let your unfailing love and faithfulness always protect me, for troubles surround me, too many to count. My sins pile up so high, I can't see my way out. They outnumber the hairs on my head. I have lost all courage. Please, Lord, rescue me. Come quickly, Lord, and help me. May those who try to destroy me be humiliated and put to shame. May those who take delight in my trouble be turned back in disgrace. Let them be horrified by their shame, for they said, aha, we've got him now. But may all, may all who search for you be filled with joy and gladness in you. May those who love your salvation repeatedly shout, the Lord is great. As for me, since I am poor and needy, let the Lord keep me in his thoughts. You are my helper and my savior. Oh, my God, do not delay. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yeah, amen. Now you can be seated. All right. I like to get the amens to reading the word there. Amen. Yeah. Well, you know, recently uh, I was in New Jersey uh, uh, for a few weeks. And I got together with two of my best friends that I grew up back in the day. And it was the first time the three of us sat in the same room in 40 years. And over the years, we talked to each other, you know, individually on the phone or Zoom or whatever it was. But it was the first time in four decades we were hanging out together again. And, you know, we, we got together over, over reasons of great joy, such as my friend's daughter had gotten married. But we also got together over reasons of great sorrow because my brother was dying of cancer. And I flew out there to make sure that uh, his last weeks, in his last weeks, he was well taken care of, and he was. And as you can imagine, uh, when, you know, your, your best friends for that long, when we got together, we took some pretty deep dives into our past. And uh, most of what we shared, we laughed so hard about it, we could barely breathe. You ever have that with your friends? You know, you recall the old days, you could barely talk. But some of it, i got to be honest with you, included the recollection of some pretty ugly mud, some ugly mire, and really deep pits of despair. Look, I'm going to be honest with you. You know, although we never did any jail time or anything like that, although, look, we deserved it. We realized that. 
But we did not come away unscathed from those days. Mud and mire are sometimes difficult to wipe off completely if it's not met with God's grace, God's love, as we sing about God's faithfulness. Sometimes if we don't have those things, they can leave a long stain on our souls. But what also added to the sober thoughts uh, about the mud and the mire in, in the time that I was back there is, that I re- is, is, is because of what I recalled and what I felt as I went to different places I haven't seen in decades. And such places instantly reminded me of all the depression, the anger, the sorrow, the self-loathing I felt as a kid. And it was because of all this I started while there meditating on Psalm 40. That's why I'm preaching on it today. I find it apropos because it richly expresses the incredible joy that we can feel when we are delivered from that pit of despair. How many can say amen to that? And it also talks about what it is like when we find ourselves yet again in that place where we need God to deliver us. In other words, it is a psalm that, it's a psalm that captures so much of the reality of what it's like to walk as a follower of God in a broken world as broken people. And this is what I want to zero in on as we meander through this psalm and, and, and talk about the realities of mud and mire and pits of despair, as well as joyous new songs that God can provide even in the face of them. But before I dive into the specifics of the psalm, I thought it might be help to teach something new maybe most of us never heard about to help us really experience the text, and not only this text, but anytime you read the psalms. You see, I want to teach you a literary schema, in other words, a way of looking at the psalms and interpreting the psalms that was kind of created by this Old Testament theologian named Walter Brueggemann. And he sees, when he looks at the Psalms, he sees woven into the fabric of the Psalms, there are three expressions, there's three schemas, if you will, uh, that, that are there. And he calls them these three things. Orientation, there's words of orientation, words of disorientation, and words of new orientation. Now, orientation psalms, orientation words, you know, describe that happy, blessed state that we feel where we're, you know, we're really grateful for and confident in the gifts of God on our life. They're the words that describe those times and seasons where you, where you have a really good job and you can meet all your bills or you feel really healthy or when you look into the eyes of a newborn child. In other words, they're the words that we feel when, ah, yes, this is the way life should be. Those are the words you see in the orientation psalms. Now, disorientation psalms, well, they're a lot different. They're the words of people who once found their smooth circumstances in life, and their nice, clear doctrines of God suddenly and painfully altered. And they are left feeling devastated and alienated and fearful and even traumatized. Words of disorientation give expression to those moments when we hear things like, sorry, Mike, but your position is going to be eliminated. Or Mr. Mr. Lee, your son has been caught stealing. Or Daddy, I'm pregnant. Or sorry, honey, I just don't feel the same way about our marriage anymore. Or in those moments where someone says, Mr. Harai, we have found tumors. It's in these very real spaces. These very real spaces. It's, it, it's, it's not uncommon in those very real spaces that our vision of God is now questioned. Our trust in Him is now challenged, and our nice airtight theology about Him is blown up into pieces. In other words, the words of disorientation are, are words of real life in a real world. The real world of disappointment and hurt, of sickness and fear, and of pain and injustice. Now, New Orientation Psalms speak of when joy breaks through the despair. These Psalms speak boldly of a new gift from God. It's a, it's a, it, they speak of a fresh intrusion that makes all things new, and even when life felt so desolate and despairing. See, things are different now. Our souls, our relationships, our walk with God have been stretched to newer and greater things. And thus, new things can be seen in our lives. New things can be seen in our world. And new things can be understood about our relationship with God. In new orientation, we return to praise. But this time, it's a sober praise. It's a mature and deeper praise. And this is why sometimes when you read in those Psalms, Uh, you see this expression, sing to the Lord a new song. Because we need something different, something more than what we sang before, because we have been brought to such a new place in so many 
ways. Now, our psalm today is particularly fascinating because the front end of it speaks of new orientation about God's deliverance. And interestingly, the back of it, the back end of it speaks of disorientation. Now, verse 2, 1 and 2, it says this, that this guy's waiting for God to act, and it was no ordinary situation. He said this, I hoped intensely, get a picture of what that sounds like, you know? I hoped intensely for the Lord to help me, and he turned to me, and he heard my cry. He lifted me up out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire, which is what I felt just about 40 years ago on December 3rd, 1981, when I became a Christian my senior year in college. I literally felt lifted up out of the pit of despair. Now, we don't know the particulars of this guy's journey, but we know it had to be pretty bad because mud and mire and pits of despair are not adjectives you use, you know, because you had a bad day at the office, okay? That's some pretty severe stuff. It's, it, it describes the experience of deep frustration and deep struggle and profound fear. And, 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 and it's one of those seasons where when you're in mud, mire, and, and, and despair, where, where no one has any hope in, in, in anything else. You know, you don't have your hope in your own wit and wisdom to bring about what you need, and, and, and nor from your community, or nor from, you know, the religious systems or your religious practices. There's just you know, at that place where there's nothing left but God to put your hope in. Have you ever been to that place of waiting with intense hope? Intense hope in God because all other hopes were exhausted. Pastors can't help you. Family and friends can't help you. Physicians and therapists can't help you. It's such a, it's such a vulnerable, vulnerable place to be, and it can really shake your faith to the core. You know, sometimes the mire, the mud, the pit, and despair can come so suddenly into someone's life. You know, many years ago, out of nowhere, I felt a lump where there should have not been one, and it was excruciating pain. And for the 10 months that followed, I saw and was misdiagnosed by seven different doctors. One doctor even told me my pain is in my head. The pain was so intense that I quit my job as a pastor. And all those months, I kept praying for God to heal me. But when the days turned into weeks and the weeks turned into months, my prayers turned from simply desperate to frustrated and outright anger towards God. You know, as Proverbs 13 verse 12 puts it, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Does anyone know what it's like to live with a sick heart because your hope was deferred? How many of us have been in or maybe are currently in that place of feeling like this relationship, this marriage, this anxiety, this dead career, this, 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 this deep sense of fear and loneliness all feels like being stuck in the mud and at the bottom of the pit of despair? Let's be honest. Sometimes despair and mud and mire of our, are of our own making, which of course makes it a lot difficult for others to look at us with sympathy, compassion, or grace. And this is why I like the last part of verse 1. He says this when he says, he, meaning God, God turned to me. Now, don't forget, he's in mud, mire, and mud. He, he turned to me and he heard my cry. Now, unfortunately, the English here misses the physicality that's really expressed in the Hebrew of the Old Testament because you could be translated at this. It says, he says, he bent down and turned his ear to me. It's a great expression uh, that, 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 that's a picture of someone who, someone's attention now is fully focused on you, who is riveted on you. That's the way God is towards us, even in the muck, even in the mire, even in the pit. Have you known or ever felt God's riveted attention on your life, particularly as you struggle? Or has your shame or your guilt created the lie that God has turned away from you? Well, whatever happened next in this guy's life, it set him up on a whole new place. He not only found through God his footing again and the end of his despair, but the writer says he was also given a new song. Verse 3 he says, he, meaning God, has given me a new song to sing a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done, and they're going to be amazed. You know, when that soul is in that place, that season of new songs, it can imagine new things. It can see new things. It can live out new possibilities. 
You know, given my sinful past, entering the ministry was an impossibility to say the least. But when God gives a new song to someone, when he gives a new life to someone, so much of the impossible becomes possible. Do you believe that this morning? And yes, to this day, and as I experienced just recently, whenever I speak with somebody who only knew me back there in the mud mire in despair, they, just like the psalmist says, they hear this and they are amazed. I assure you. Okay, trust me. If you ever heard of the, if you heard the discussions I had with my friends over an Italian dinner back in Jersey a few weeks ago, you would probably ask for my resignation by noon. I can almost guarantee you that. Now let me down, jump down to verse 5. And we see that, that though the past is full of God's wonders, the future is full of God's plans. He says this, O Lord my God, you have performed, past tense, you have performed in the past many wonders for us. And then he shifts, he says, your plans for us from here on out, your plans for us are too numerous, too numerous to list. Let me ask something, do you, do you know, do you sense in your spirits, God has more plans for you for your future? Do you take the time in solitude, in silence, in prayer, in meditation, or, 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 or seeking wisdom from others to discern the something more that God has for you? Or have you just plain stopped asking the question about his plans for your life? You stopped asking because, man, you're just too darn busy, or you just feel too old. Or maybe you feel too young, or maybe you feel too ill-equipped, or whatever it is, you've stopped asking about those numerous plans that God may have for you. Famed educator Sir Kenneth Robinson has said, many adults have no idea what they're really capable of living. He says, most folks, he, he, he uses this expression, most folks simply bump along the bottom. They do things without any great sense of fulfillment. And, and he mentioned that, and I'm going to quote him here. He mentioned that it's not that we try to aim too high and fail, but it's that we aim too low and hit the mark. Wow. Yeah, wow, I was right. So I asked you this morning, where is your aim? Where is your aim in terms of God's plan for you? Are you aiming too low? Now, to be clear, I'm going to be clear what I'm not talking about. Okay, I'm not talking about taking on some spectacular action for God or suddenly becoming a workaholic for Jesus or quitting your job and going into full-time ministry, okay? Look, in my 40 years as being a Christian, 37 years of being in the ministries, God's plan for me has not always been big at all. Most often, most often it's just a few people at a time that I, I minister to. But however big or small the plan is, it still amazes me that I, this punk, this little criminal, for goodness sake, get, gets to be a part of God's divine work in the world. Think about it. Think about uh, that, that God has a plan, not just for you in church, but God has a plan for the way you go about your work in your cubicle. God has a plan for the way you interact with others. Do you know? Do you know that about your work, or do you just go about your work without God's plan being woven in? Do you know that God has a plan for what and how you decide to pay and care for your employees. Do you know God's plan? Or when you're out of obedience to God, you give up your time to your elderly parents or to other struggling friends, do you understand that they're all part of God's plan? It is all part of God's purpose to manifest, to bring to bear his purposes and power and values and character, not just onto the big things of life, but into the small nooks and crannies of our everyday world. Maybe that's why the psalmist says the plans are too numerous to count, because he gets He's thinking about all the small places God has plans for us. Amen? Maybe it's just impacting just one person in your day for the sake of Christ. Maybe it's serving as a greeter uh, to help create a safe, warm environment for, for, for people needing to find God. Maybe it's just taking somebody over to get some coffee and say, how's your soul, my brother? At the very least, at the very least, he invites us into the glorious project of making disciples of Christ. And here's what I mean by that so we clearly understand. 
about making disciples here. It's, it's, what I mean by that is helping one another live into a greater intimacy with Christ, okay? A greater likeness to Christ, a greater wholeness and healing in Christ, and also to help each other serve Christ in his mission in this world where we live, work, play, and study. Do you know that at minimum, at minimum, that is the divine plan for your life? Amen. And I'll be honest, when you, when you finally grab hold of God's plan for you, particularly in this issue of discipleship, you will be blown away. You'll be amazed how God will use you or where he might take you. You know, for that one specific plan of making disciples that he has given me, he has taken me from New York City to Nepal. He has taken me from refugee camps in Asia to the homeless encampments, encampments in Pearl City. He's taken me from the ghettos of Bangkok to now to the slopes of the Ko'olau. This is just because of one single plan that he has for my life. But to live into those plans, we have to come to that place like the psalmist did as expressed in verse 8. I take joy in doing your will. The word joy gushes with passion that fuels his living into God's plans. But let's think about that for a second, be real. Maybe some of us, if we're a little more honest, we would rewrite that line honestly and say, just some of us, it is a burden to do your will. It is a burden to make disciples. It is a burden to lead a small group. It is a burden to help the poor. It is, it is a burden to listen to someone's problems. It is a burden to do your will, oh God. If that is you, let me ask, what is it that you need? What is it that you, I want you to really think about this. What is it that you really need to help turn the burden of living into God's plans into a joy that just bleeds out of every facet of your being? What is it that you need? Seek it out. Don't stop here. All right, so that's the first 10 verses, full of joyful and exciting stuff. It feels good to put a period and go home, but oh, no, there's a lot more here. <laughs> because this is really crazy. It, you know, the, the, the writer moves towards expressions now that you don't expect at all after that big, hairy, glorious stuff, right? From verse 11 and following, it, he radically changes the demeanor of the entire psalm, and it goes from the expressions of new orientation back to disorientation, from, from ecstatic joy to frightened lament, from I'm so grateful to I am so scared. Let me reread some of it to refresh your memory, starting in verse 11. Lord, don't hold back your tender mercies from me. Let your unfailing love and faithfulness always protect me. Why? Because troubles surround me, too many to count. My sins pile up so high, I can't see my way out. They outnumber the hairs of my head. I've lost all courage. Please, Lord, rescue me. Come quickly, Lord, and help me. As for me, since I'm poor and needy, let the Lord keep me in his thoughts. Lord, you are my helper and my savior. Oh, my God, do not delay. Is that a change or what? This movement from joyful exuberance in life to cries of fear and pain, it's kind of an odd sequence. You think you'd start out with the bad stuff and you end up with the really ah, praise stuff, right? But he does just the opposite. I'm thinking, why does he do that? Well, maybe, just maybe, I can't help but wonder if it is purposely written this way, if it is purposely, purposely organized this way so that it reflects real life with God in a broken world with broken people who follow a perfect God. Think of how jarring it is for a guy who just had those sublime thoughts in verses 2 and 3, now says in verse 12, oh, my sins are piled so high, I can't see my way out. There are more than the numbers of the hair on my head. I have lost all courage. Isn't he contradicting himself? I mean, didn't he just talk about having God's instructions forged on his heart? So how did he end up here, yet again, in the mire? How did he end up in the sins that are piled so high that he can't see his way out? How did the profound confidence of being on steady ground, as he said before, turn into, I've lost all courage? This is one of the reasons why I really love this psalm, because it's so full of real contradictions, just like Steve Page. <laughs> That's a nervous laughter there, yeah. <laughs> but think about it. 
Think about it. Who doesn't know this kind of walk with God? Right? Raise your hand if you know that walk with God. Two of you. Oh, praise God. The rest of you? Really? Do you walk on water as well? Just want to check. I'm just kidding, of course. But does anybody really know that journey? That journey where the, the joy of the new orientation can be fully reversed. You know that journey? The journey of being blessed, yet still doing the things that are regretful and downright sinful. A journey with God that is not victory after victory and up and to the right, but one of ups and downs and full of turnarounds. How many of us have cried out to God to save us or have repented? And he taught us something really important for our lives. And, and our lives actually changed. But at some later point, we're crying out yet again about the exact same stuff. Isn't life like that? I know mine is. Now here's where we need to notice something very deeply crucial in this personal journey here. As much as this guy has lost himself yet again, he has not lost sight of who is with him in the midst of that crash, in the midst of being overwhelmed, even though this new mire is in part self-inflicted, as he says, you know, my sins are piled so high, and even though he knows he's overwhelmed, he has faith that his God will love him nonetheless. Remember in verse 11, he says, let your unfailing love and faithfulness always protect me. He knows that even if he fails to love God, God's love doesn't fail him. Amen? Amen. That's why he calls it unfailing love. Yes. Yes. And, I, and, and look, I, I think he recognizes what our executive pastor, uh, Chris Pan, brilliantly stated in a sermon a couple of weeks ago. He said this, and I quote him, the good news of the gospel isn't that we cling to Jesus, is that Jesus clings to us. Yeah. Breathe that in. Breathe that in for a second. It's not the gospel is that we cling to Jesus, but Jesus clings to us. And I think the writer, the, yes, the writer knows he has screwed up in major ways. And he knows, and at the same time, he also knows to whom he can take yet again his screwed up life. And he can do so because he seems to fully grasp, as Richard Rohr has written, God does not love us because we are good. God loves us because God is good. And that's why he can say with great confidence when he's neck deep in sin, let your unfailing love and faithfulness always protect me. And by the way, let's not skim past the comment in verse 12 where he says, I've lost all courage. Look, I don't know if this is a guy thing. I don't know if this is a Jersey thing. But you know what? It takes a lot for me to say that and own up to that. All right? I don't say that even to myself, much less out loud to people. And this guy even wrote it down for people to read about and sing about for ages. Now remember, the, psalm, the word psalm means song, okay? And, and, and I bring that up because, because these verses weren't just whispered softly to ourselves, oh Lord, I'm losing courage. No, these, these were part of communal worship songs. They were like, as we gather today, can you imagine, we stood up to say, Lord, we've just pronounced in song, I have lost all courage. That's part of worship. And why would such seemingly weak words be sung in communal worship? Again, because they were meant to free up our souls to live truthfully before the Lord and before each other. Yes, to our macho mentality, such a confession sounds weak. But in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God, it is the very place of true strength, the strength to know and speak the truth of our lives. Look, after nearly four decades of ministry and counseling hundreds, if not more than that, people in my life, I can confidently tell you this, that so much of our inner torture and our perpetual failures in life come out of a heart that simply won't be honest. They come out of a life that wants to live in denial. They come out of a heart that is just too arrogant to say, man, I screwed up, I'm scared to death, and I'm too weak to handle this. Yet this is exactly what makes entities like Alcoholics Anonymous so powerful. How do you get out of the road addiction? What's the first step of the first 12 steps in, in, in Alcoholics Anonymous? It's this, is when we admit openly, I am powerless over alcohol and my life is unmanageable. That's just step one of the 12-step program. And if you don't say that out loud and with another, nothing of the other 11 steps are going to help you. And that's 
basically verse 12 in a nutshell. And this is a crucial step because it's exactly there in that truth-filled space that the journey of healing begins, that the first step towards another new orientation begins, that the first words of a new song can start to be written for your life in the truth. You see, folks, hiddenness and repression and faking it can't create hope. One Old Testament theologian put it this way, the abandonment of pretense is the prerequisite to new joy. And that's what we want to do in our prayers, in our worship, in our Bible studies, is to abandon pretense. Amen? Amen. You're doing that this week in your small group? Can you just say, brothers and sisters, we are abandoning pretense. This is going to get real. But this is exactly what the psalm, psalm does, right? As Lewis, uh, C.S. Lewis put it this way. Lay before God what is in us, not what ought to be in us. So many prayers we hear in our small groups are prayers we ought to say, not really prayers that we should say. That's really the truth, right? So let me bring up one last thing that's not mentioned in the psalm, but we need this because, look, we need to be a community for one another where the abandonment of pretense is easy to do where it can be safe to lay God, to lay before God what is truly in us, even if it doesn't sound noble, even if it doesn't sound very spiritual, even if it doesn't sound very theologically precise or correct. You know, many years ago, I taught a course for the Bible Institute of Hawaii on Psalms. And I read through a couple of Psalms that, had, that, that boldly blamed God for all the problems in these people's lives. And they felt that God had turned their back on them. If you ever read Psalm 88, I don't have time to read it here. It's a very angry, bleak psalm. The psalm ends this way. And my closest friend is darkness. Not God, but darkness. And so I asked the class, could you pray in that same way? And I remember a woman raised her hand and said emphatically, I could never pray like that. I said, why can't you pray like that? She says, because it sounds so disrespectful. It's in the Word of God, but it's disrespectful. And I appreciate her honesty, but I have to tell you something. I knew right then and there that she was not going to be the one I was going to turn to when I needed someone with whom I could pray the truth of my soul, the truth of my journey, with all its doubts, with all its fears, with all its rage, with all its anger and accusations towards God. She was not going to be the one. My point is, sometimes to follow God as the mire deepens or as the desolate landscape expands before us may require us to be very candid in our speech towards God, to pray out our fears, to announce our disappointments with Him, to shout our needs, and to own our own lack of courage. Folks, look, real life with a real God demands nothing less than real speech. To do anything less than that is going to shrink your soul. Straight up. Sometimes our Christian spirituality is a bit too positive for me. We, we censor out the voices of desperation and darkness and disorientation. And instead we like to go from strength to strength and victory. There's a lot of victory in the Lord. Don't get me wrong. But it's not always so. And the way... When we go to, you know, just want to stay positive, this way of praying not only ignores the Psalms, but it's quite frankly an outright lie in terms of our real life experience. So my question is, are we the type of people who are very comfortable hearing such honest confessions from another soul? Can we hold the guilt and the shame and the rage and the self-loathing of someone else in our hearts with grace and truth and compassion and love? What happens to our community, our prayer life, our journeys of disorientation if we can't do that for each other? Look, in rea reality, difficult and devastating things happen. Layoffs happen. Harm happens. Sickness happens. Okay? Fear happens. And to pray as if the world is so wonderful in the midst of all that personal or communal disaster, it's just ludicrous if not downright hurtful. See, the way of peace and healing and joy is not simply by being spiritually cheerful or denying reality, but it, it is coming, it is in coming to terms with our real grief, our real pain, and maybe even our real anger at God. And this is where the Psalms help us tremendously. 
They free us. If you can only see that the Psalms free us to pray, to sing from the reality of our souls. And as another theologian put it, the first condition of healing is to give voice to pain. And that's why those psalms are there, because God wants us to heal. And in order to heal, he knows we must give voice to pain, personally, communally, socially, what have you. Now, many years ago, I was counseling a man who's married, lost his wife after being married 40 years. And he'd be in my office, and he would frequently apologize for crying. Guys always apologize for crying. Oh, sorry, man, sorry. And I'm like, I said, you don't have to apologize for loving a woman for 40 years. I told him that, you know, you don't have to apologize for tears because tears are but love put in liquid form. They're love put in liquid form, and God gave us tear ducts to help us, to help us physically, to help us viscerally, to help us soulfully process the pain. And finally, when he grasped that, that tears of grief were part of the journey to find new ground, part of the journey to find a new song, oh man, he cried a lot more freely. Now, think about it this way. Can you imagine if I told the guy when he starts kind of, you know, doing this, Oh, come on, man, grow some hair, will you? Gee whiz, what's with that? You know, the, the, the Robert De Niro School of Compassion, you know what I mean? Imagine if I said that to him, come on. I'd have to pop him right out of grief, right? No, man, he'd go run and hide and be worse off. He'd be worse off, you see? And, and we've got to understand that, you know? Uh, uh, Watch your uneasiness. Be sensitive about your own uneasiness when people are kind of really expressing themselves in, in a raw way, okay? Don't let your uneasy, uneasiness about things short-circuit God's given pathway towards hope, towards healing, and a new song. Yes, people in pain need an encourager, but not at the expense of silence or denial. Yes, people who are in sin need someone to rebuke them, but not in a way that makes people hide from us or put a mask on point is, when Christians have no empathy for the Psalm 40 journey, people are going to duck, they're going to hide, they're going to pretend, and they will stay stuck in the mire, in the mud, and in the pit. Think about what it might be like to face the darkness in our souls and our lives and have no one to walk with us by our side. You think it hurts now? The hurts and fears that haunt you are going to be twice as smothering when you feel isolated and alone. So I end end this message with some more true words. One last quote by Larry Crabb, Christian writer. He says, look, the passion to play it safe is strong. The passion to protect ourselves, to keep our wounds out of sight, where no one can make them worse, is the strongest passion in our hearts. And it will remain so until... We experience a certain kind of relationship until we meet the crucified and resurrected Christ and experience, and I like how he puts this on there too, and experience a person like Christ, someone broken yet beautiful, just like the guy who wrote the psalm of Psalm 40, broken yet beautiful. May you experience the broken yet beautiful among us And may the result of being that kind of community be be a source of the restoration of God's hope in your life and his new song for your journey. May you be the ones who out of your understanding of a Psalm 40 journey bring the, the, the resurrected life of Christ to a broken, hurting soul in the mire of life. Amen? So what's God saying to you? Let's finish up here. Is there something he wants you to say? Is there something he wants you to do? Is there something he wants you to change? I'm going to pray for us right now because I think we could all use a little prayer in this area. And then Shevis and the worship guy is going to come up for one last worship song. But, but especially for those who are really stuck, I want to pray. But, but if you want to give your life to Jesus, don't let another minute go by. Maybe this is the moment you've got to do it. Maybe this is the moment. You feel like you're in a pit. Trust me, God will get you out. God will get you out. God got this jamoke out. Okay? I should have been doing 10 to 15 at Rollway State, and I'm not talking about the university. God can deliver you out of your pit. So let's just pray. Let's just pray. Lord, some of us here are feeling the mud. We're feeling the mire. We're feeling the pit. 
Maybe it's caused by physical pain. Maybe it's caused by emotional pain. Maybe it's caused by spiritual pain. Maybe it's caused by financial loss and pain. Whatever it is, Lord, I pray by your spirit, come and help. Just like the psalmist says, Lord, come and help us. Out of your unfailing love and faithfulness to us, come and change our situation. Lord, help us know that even though we may be under the pile of sin, you still love the one under the pile. And for those of you who want to give your life to Jesus, just pray pray the simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I confess the emptiness of my life without you. Forgive me, Lord, for all my sins. Thank you for your deep love for me. And as best as I know how, I commit my life to you. Come and fill me with your spirit today. And in your gracious and loving name, and all God's people said, amen. You know, if you prayed that prayer before, if you're at home and you prayed that prayer to give your life to Jesus for the first time, just, just hit the, 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 the raised hand button or whatever it is in the, in the uh, chat area. Let us know that you've given your life to Christ. And hit the prayer button, meet with a prayer warrior. If you're here and you gave your life to Jesus this morning, let me know. Or when we have, we're going to have some prayer out in the back patio out there, out in the back of the night. The prayer team's going to be there if you have prayer needs. If you need a little prayer for the muck, the mire, and the desperate pits, Please go get some prayer before you take off today. And, and again, remember, remember that the gospel is not, not us and how good we're at clinging to Jesus, but how steadfast Jesus clings to us. And that he's not just looking at the pile of sin. He sees the one whom he loves beneath the pile and is committed to that person. Amen? Amen. So receive this blessing. May you know way down in your soul of that committed, unfailing, and faithful love of Jesus Christ on your life. May you be free to bring all the truth of your heart to him and to your brothers and sisters in Christ. And may he give you a new song this week in your heart to give him praise and to declare to the assembly how great is our God. And may you be used by God to be the hands, the arms, the ears, and the words of Jesus to those who are still stuck in the muck, stuck in the mire, and deep down in the pit. For from him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be all the glory. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thanks for watching at home. Take care. We'll see you next week. Everybody else here, God bless you.